Um, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, panel 2B, Implementing Greener Shorelines for Resiliency and the Environment. Uh, my name is Jessica Fain. I'm going to be moderating today's uh, panel. Um, I'm a planner here in New York City in the uh, Department of City Planning. And um, uh, thank you for joining and for not uh, being out there on the deck where <laughs> it looks really nice right now. Um, I promise you can do that right when we're done at, um, at 2.45. Uh, so um, I'm really thrilled to be here today with this really amazing group of panelists. Um, uh, many of whom I've gotten to work with over um, the last uh, few years. Um, everyone here is, is engaged in work that's really pushing the boundaries about how we link together um, ecologically minded shoreline, near shore, and in water design um, as an alternative to traditional coastal engineering structures. And um, this is particularly important in, in light of our collective mandate for um, uh, adapting our coastal areas to climate change. You know, these are issues that we've been talking about um, throughout the panel uh, today, but i um, really excited here to talk uh, really about what's happening at the edge um, uh, with, these, with this great group. And um, what links to this group, I think, is that um, there's this belief that we can really do better. Uh, we don't need to think about um, protecting against storms and restoring and improving our environment in vacuums. And there's really ways to bring together that thinking. With ORR and uh, DEC's Hudson River Estuary Program uh, sponsored a research, research endeavor called the Coastal Green Infrastructure Research Plan for New York City. Um, and the goal of this plan was to ask some hard questions about What's, what's the truth about this green inf coastal green infrastructure? You know, what can it really do to, to sort of protect us and, uh, in the event of a coastal storm? And also, what, is, what does it mean for the environment? And so um, the plan asked, uh, what is the state of the science for coastal green infrastructure? Um, and and uh, the, the team, um, Hugh, who's here with me now, as well as um, a bunch of the rest of the team who's uh, in the audience today, um, it did an in-depth, uh, extensive literature review on sort of the state of the science. Uh, where are the gaps in our collective uh, knowledge about these issues? And then what are the priorities for filling in those gaps and really advancing this work? And that plan, um, which I encourage you to take a look at, um, looked at six different strategies. It looked at constructed wetlands and maritime forests, uh, constructed reefs, uh, constructed breakwater islands, channel shallowing, ecologically enhanced bulkheads and revetments, and living shorelines. It also identified some cross-cutting uh, meta strategies, which really tried to uh, sort of cut across all those, those different specific strategies, um, such as monitoring and um, identifying some regulatory constraints. And so, as I mentioned, Hugh um, from Arcadis, who's sitting next to me, um, was uh, the lead PI on this, along with the Stevens Institute, and he'll be discussing in a moment this plan in, in a bit more detail. Uh, the plan was released in January, and currently um, us, along with DEC and the Harbor, es the, um, Harbor Estuary Program, um, along with some folks from the Consensus Building Institute, are partnering to organize efforts to collaborate with stakeholders on these priority um, topics in the coming year. And if this is something that's interesting to you, um, I encourage you to find me, uh, Kristen Marcel from DEC, who uh, should be around, or Rob Pirani, and just talk to us about it, about how you'd like to be engaged with this. Um, so with this plan sort of in the back of your mind, um, Hugh is going to kick us off with an overview, and then the rest of the panelists are going to reflect on uh, their engagement with these types of issues and uh, sort of from their point of view. Uh, so just to quickly introduce uh, the group, uh, to my left is Hugh Roberts, a principal civil engineer at Arcadis. Um, as I mentioned, he was the lead um, principal invest in investigator on the Coastal Green Infrastructure Research Plan, and he's also been engaged with numerous other resiliency and coastal redu uh, risk reduction planning and engineering projects uh, here in New York City, in Louisiana, and beyond. Uh, Following Hugh, uh, we will hear from uh, Pippa Brashear, who is the newly appointed Director of Planning and Resiliency at SCAPE Landscape Architects. Uh, she also has extensive experience working with resiliency in New York Harbor, and um, I think we'll be specifically talking about her involvement with offshore breakwater projects off of Staten Island. Uh, following Pippa, we will hear from Bram Gunther, um, to my right, who is the president of the Natural Areas Conservancy, chief of forestry, horticulture, and natural resources at the New York uh, City Department of Parks and Recreation. 
and um, uh, Bram helps oversee research and programming to protect and enhance the city's wetlands, forests, and grasslands. And um, will hopefully be speaking to us about some of the data sets, inventory, and tools um, that they are developing to enhance wetland restoration opportunities, uh, particularly in light of sea level rise. Following Bram, we're going to hear from Liz Smith, um, who is joining us from uh, the Nature Conservancy um, as an environmental economist. And will be talking to us about how we value nature and understanding the trade-offs uh, to help with this decision making that we make when, when putting anything into, into, the, into the waterways. Um, and uh, we'll uh, be mentioning Howard Beach as an example uh, to illustrate um, some of that work. And then finally, we're going to hear from uh, Catherine Sievit at my far left, um, uh, who is an associate professor of landscape architecture at the Spitzer School of Architecture at City College. Um, and she today will be t discussing um, her work on the structures of coastal resilience projects um, and the team that she and her uh, she and that she and her team conceived of for Jamaica Bay, uh, which merges ecosystem restoration, uh, nature-based features, and coastal storm risk management in a holistic set of stra strategic recommendations. So, a full panel. Um, each one is going to speak for. Um, five to seven minutes or so, and then um, hopefully we'll leave us plenty of time for questions at the end. So with that, I will turn it over to Hugh. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, uh, I'm sure everyone said that they never, never presented on a boat before, but I've also never had bright lights and a camera, front, so <laughs> this is new to me. Also, the, the lounges on the, on the left and right is very nice. Um, as, as Jessica mentioned, I was one of the lead authors with, uh, for the, the natural, I'm sorry, the Coastal Green Infrastructure Research Plan, and that was a plan that many of you may be familiar with just because the, at the time of developing that plan, there was a uh, considerable team both working directly on the plan at Arcadis, uh, the Stevens Institute, uh, actually many people on the panel, New York City Parks, SCAPE, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Matthews Nielsen, and of course a tremendous amount of work from city planning and and NDEC, but additionally there was just a tremendous uh, amount of, of, of support in terms of having different workshops, sitting together, brainstorming, trying to understand what are the challenges, what are the questions we need to ask, and how do we go about answering them, what are the priorities in terms of really understanding uh, the challenges of our coastline, and, and looking at coastal green infrastructure from a hazard standpoint, so from a gradual hazard, everything from long-term erosion, to event-based hazards, uh, storms, closer, Okay, thank you. Thing. Nobody told me. Um, to, to also, of course, the ecological side of things. And so for, uh, for our study, we, we, we focused on the six items that Jessica had mentioned, uh, wetlands, uh, reefs, and, and, and uh, living shorelines and ecological enhanced uh, bulkheads and revetments are really what I'll focus on today. But uh, the, the, what I'll discuss specifically is not so much the literature review. The literature review, as Jessica mentioned, is available. It's available online. Uh, your handout that you have actually has the website and the address to, to find that information. Uh, but really where we want to take this and, and where I think is most interesting in terms of uh, engaging this group but also setting up uh, the rest of our panelists in terms of how some of these elements are then brought into other projects is what are the strategies, what are the research agendas that have been identified uh, as something to move forward with. And it, as, as Jessica had mentioned, uh, there's an ongoing effort now to really understand, to build a consensus, to understand what are different agencies, what are different groups believe to be the priority of some of these. Um, so as far as the strategies, the, there's really two groups, the, the meta strategies and the individual projects. And from the meta strategy standpoint, what we mean by meta strategy, and I have to say, the term meta strategy came from the Nature Conservancy, and I, I actually really like it. Uh, it, it stuck and it, it really helps, it helps conceptualize. But what we found in, in this research agenda and, and through our literature review and, and discussions in our workshops was that many of the same concerns uh, are, are across many of these strategies. They, they, they face many of the same challenges, and, and those challenges range from lack of data, to lack of understanding, but uh, there's a specifics, of course, might, might reside within each of the elements, but in a broader sense, there's really a need for coordination, and so meetings like this, getting together like this, is really critical to, to meeting that mission. Uh, the first, and kind of the, the upfront, the first research agenda item that we had put in in the meta strategies was developing a conceptual model. Uh, or, or an influence diagram, essentially. So understanding from a hazard standpoint, from a gradual and an, an, ep and an episodic, and, and from an ecological standpoint, what are the drivers? What is it that's changing our landscape? What is it that we think is changing it now, influencing it uh, uh, adversely now, and potentially in the future when you consider things like sea level rise? 
Um, and and how, do, how do we understand those drivers? Is there something about the research that's missing? Uh, it re the idea behind a conceptual model is to be able to get agencies on the same page, uh, people who are funding different efforts, to focus their energy on those uh, that are the biggest challenges in terms of really advancing the science. And there are some, uh, there's some conceptual models that have, have been framed in different agencies or across agencies, but one of the recommendations is, is to collaborate and find a way to have a platform for everyone to work from and to, to, to edit and to, 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 um, to be able to change over time as we learn more. Uh, the second, and this is really tied to, to the, conceptual, the conceptual model or the influence diagram, is monitoring. And, and monitoring has been mentioned many, many times today, of course. Um, and, and, and it should continue. And, and Pippa and I talked about this, and I know. And when she speaks, she'll she'll speak more more in detail about monitoring and how that'll happen, as, uh, how that's being looked at at some sites. But really, the challenge with monitoring is always, of course, funding constraints, uh, understanding what you are monitoring and how you adapt that monitoring plan. But one of the things that uh, has been recommended, of course, in line with the conceptual model, is to develop a monitoring plan that can support that model. So we can learn from that, we can iterate on that, we can revise that plan, we can do it consistently across agencies, across projects. Um, that's something that I, I know has been part of the conversation now and will continue to be one of the, the conversation moving forward. So of course, uh, bringing in input on, on those type of topics are, are critical. Uh, and part of that, uh, the next one of the next agenda items we had recommended was cross-agency sharing. So understanding a lot of times what happens <coughs> is, is either single surveys like bathymetric surveys or, be or benthic surveys, um, they, they will be brought into certain projects to achieve a project goal, but that information doesn't always make it back to the scientists or the engineers who, who are looking to develop our understanding of these. So actually having that inventory of data, finding a way uh, when data is collected on project by project basis or, or in, a, in, a, in a broader sense is centralized and, and accessible to many people. And that doesn't necessarily mean just data from monitoring or just baseline data, but there were some examples, for instance, uh, the European Union uh, in, 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 uh, in, in um, North, Northwest Europe, across countries, they're currently now putting together coastal zone management uh, databases where they're putting together projects, they're, they're putting those projects in different portals, different agencies across countries are using those to, to learn from them, to post lessons learned, and, and to try to inform the broader community. And so some of these, some of these data uh, sharing concepts aren't necessarily just source data, but, but ideas, and how do, you, how do you find a way to centralize those ideas to get the word out and to get the lessons learned? Uh, one of the ways we really see doing this, and another one of our agenda items, is, is pilot projects. And this is really what's, what some of the discussion from Pip and others will be, is how do we find the, the, pro the best projects, the right projects, to put our focus in in the near term, to get projects on the ground, and to learn from those, to, to, to study those, to monitor those, to have adaptive management plans so we can learn from them and, and improve the process to not only understand and improve the science around the, these concepts, because we, we will not get it right, we all know that, but we need, we, need to get it, we need to get it right enough where we can get some things on the ground and, and learn from them. And so finding what are, the, what are the most appropriate pilots is certainly one of the recommendations. Uh, in order to do that, uh, some of the things that we've identified in the plan as well that are critically important is just understanding some of the physical conditions. So another one of the, the tasks or one of the things we've recommended is, is really, we understand there are things, for instance, in the upper Hudson, the ice is, is an issue, or wakes and waves uh, in, in all, all parts of the harbor are an issue. In terms of planting wetlands, sustaining wetlands, keeping them in place, uh, the understanding these physical forces, understanding the appropriate portions of the shoreline that you can actually apply these strategies is critically important. We don't have a lot of the baseline data behind that. Uh, one of the other ideas to help, to help not, not so much on a baseline data standpoint, but in terms of integrating and having a consistent plan across across different projects is having different tools and one of the examples was a rapid assessment tool and that would be many rapid assessment tools have been developed but the idea would be to have a consistent rapid assessment tool for different habitats in different habitat types that you can use to, to identify benefits across different habitats in a consistent way throughout the harbor uh, so that we can evaluate these projects more comparatively to, to one another. Uh, Another uh, and very critical, and I think this is something we continue to talk about, and to me this has been one of the most important and, and interesting research agenda items that, that I think is, will, will continually challenge us because it, 
uh, green infrastructure is not uh, a black and white uh, type development. It's, it's just a quantification. How, how do we quantify this? Uh, I know the Nature Conservancy uh, has been looking into this. Uh, the fi I actually talked to Andrew this morning from, from eConcrete, and he mentioned he was at a conference last week where the National Fish and Wildlife Service has been looking at taking 40 different sites along the Northeast, finding ways to learn from those and actually bring down metrics to help us understand, quantify resiliency, and how do we go about doing that with these, with these, with these different projects, and how do, how do we all learn and, and work from the same platform? Uh, and then the last few, and, and, and I, I will end on this, is, is beyond the meta strategy, there were some very specific strategies focusing on some of the different shoreline treatments we can learn from. And then the two that I think, that I think are most important and those that I, I believe will be advanced and continue to be advanced by this group and, and many, many others is first and foremost the flow resistance. So th looking at flow resistance for wetlands, uh, living shorelines, how does, that, how does that protect our shoreline from erosion? Also how does it, how does it what benefit does it have in storm conditions, uh, large storm conditions? Uh, that is something that we've identified and of course many have identified is, is a research need not only in New York but, but just uh, internationally. Uh, the other is guidelines. So in terms of putting together living shorelines or, or ecologically enhanced bulkhead and revetments, having a consistent guideline to do that, and of course at the time of our study, the, the wedge study was not yet out, but I just wanted to highlight that the wedge study is the kind of advancement that we're looking for in terms of getting people on the same page, putting together some guidelines and, and advancing the science together. So with that, uh, I will pass it to Fred. Okay. Uh, right. So thanks, Hugh. Uh, yeah, so next up, uh, we're going to hear um, from Pippa. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Pippa with SCAPE. Um, and <coughs> I think, uh, you know, was, I want to speak a little bit from the perspective of, um, of someone who's been involved in trying to develop these types of projects and formulate the ideas from them um, and, and is at a point where um, trying to be involved in and see them implemented. And what are the, what are the, big, the big research agendas out of the ones that, that Hugh has listed that really come to the forefront as you try to think about, about how you um, explain these projects and get these projects built? Um, I think the main reason I'm here on this panel is um, I and, and SCAPE as a, as a firm um, as developed the, the HUD Rebuild by Design winning proposal for living breakwaters off the south shore of Staten Island. Um, and I'll just take a little bit of time to kind of explain for people who don't know what that project is. So Rebuild by Design was a, was a design competition um, uh, by HUD, the Department of National Department of Housing um, and Urban Development. Um, and the competition was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And what it did was bring together interdisciplinary teams to come up with new and innovative solutions um, that address uh, resilience, definitely flood risk, but more broadly resilience in the sandy impacted region. Um, and uh, there, are, there were six um, finalists that were awarded money, and you can go to the Rebuild by the web, web Design website and, um, and see those projects. But um, SCAPE developed one of the winning proposals for living breakwaters, um, and New York State received $60 million to implement that project. Um, and the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery from the state, I don't, I don't think anyone from the Governor's Office is here today, but if they are, you can pick their brain about the next steps, um, is implementing that project. So what the project is and, and how it was developed as part of the design competition, um, I feel is, is sort of representative of, of what we're looking for in terms of coastal green infrastructure. The, the project is that, that is moving forward is 13,000 linear feet of living breakwater off the south shore of Staten Island. So between you know, a tenth of a mile and a half of a mile offshore. And, and it has a sort of threefold benefit. The first is to reduce risk and specifically to reduce um, wave wave impacts, to attenuate waves and reduce erosion. So actually building up um, and re or perhaps even reversing uh, the long-term erosion that's happened on the shoreline of Staten Island um, and reducing the most damaging impacts of, of flooding. And so when we talk about what, you know, what risk is, you know, we're looking at those things that um, wave energy, the energy that hits the shoreline and not necessarily just keeping the water out. So there's different components of that. The project also aims to have ecological benefits in the form of creating hard structure habitat as part of the structures that provide habitat for juvenile fish and shellfish and potentially um, 
to create calmer waters behind and reduce the turbidity of waters behind the breakwater, creating benefits for other shallow, shallow water ecosystems. That's the, the ecosystem part. But there's also a third component, which um, I think some people broadly and generically would call social resilience. Um, but we see it as like all of those other benefits that come from this type of project. And I think is important to think about as we think about coastal green infrastructure too, because it really is tied to the long-term sustainability and stewardship of these places. So one thing that the calmer water and the existence of these, these habitats offshore can do is actually enhance the ability to access the shoreline, literally by creating more beach, but also creating calm waters for recreation. And built along with that, there need to be educational programs. So the project is, is very tied into South Shore Staten Island schools. We've been working with the um, Harbor Foundation. There's a lot of um, folks from the Harbor School here today in terms of how we might engage um, students and citizen science actually in the in in the um, development and growth of say oysters on the breakwaters and in the long-term monitoring of the project and so those were the those were the, the the big ideas that that really formed the basis of this proposal and as I said um, the state the governor's office of storm recovery is moving forward with this and actually like definitely very real last week we had a public scoping meeting for the environmental impact statement if you want to read the scoping document for that it is available online um, and uh, the application is open for the citizens advisory committee so if you if you are a you know if you you are a Staten Island stakeholder or you're a stakeholder in the harbor and, and you would like to be part of the citizens advisory committee those applications will be open for a month so this is a real project um, and just the things I want to touch on, and I really want to leave it more for the conversation, but I want to make sort of three, three points related to the research agenda um, in terms of, of this perspective on coastal green infrastructure. Um, and the first is really is we need to talk about what we mean by coastal green infrastructure. When I say natural and nature-based features or greener shorelines for coastal resilience, what am I really talking about? Am I talking about a breakwater or a wetland? Um, am I t um, these all have different implications. And, and what is the type of risk reduction that I'm achieving for this? Um, we don't need to have one idea of what this is, but we need to talk about the specifics and what they are, because each of these different types have different benefits in terms of ecology, in terms of risk reduction. And it's only when we really start talking about the details um, that, that, that that makes sense. And I think we need to ask those fundamental questions. We need to ask, what is the shoreline? You know, is it the FEMA shoreline? Is it the intertidal zone? Is it the high water mark? These things have really, these sort of meta issues have really big impacts in how we can actually achieve these projects. Um, and then the second is, uh, to reiterate what Hugh said I was going to talk about, is we need proofs of concept. We need to monitor what's there before these projects go in, and so we know what happens when they're done. But we need more projects, too. And we need projects, whether they are out there already or they're projects that we're building that are large enough scale pilots that we can really understand their effects on the larger ecosystem. Um, and then I think the other thing that, that initiatives like Rebuild by Design and like Structures of Coastal Resilience with Catherine has, we'll probably talk about later, um, is the role of design in these process. Um, I'm a designer. Scape is a design office. We worked collaboratively with a team of engineers, like Parsons Brinkerhoff, ocean and coastal consultants with ecologists like SeaArk um, and with the Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, but the, the team was led by designers. And I think that as we try to have these, these coastal green infrastructure projects are inherently interdisciplinary and bring different disciplines together. Um, and we really see a role for the agency of design in looking at the, all the information that's out there in new ways and bringing different constituencies together and also communicating these ideas because it really requires sort of a communication across disciplines. So those are sort of my three talking points for others. Great, thank you, Pippa. Um, I think you did a great job of painting the image of what uh, these living breakwaters might be. Usually there's un great images behind you yeah. uh, that SCAPE is famous for that um, are unfortunately don't, we have this other view behind us today. Um, okay, so next uh, we're going to hear from Bram Gunther. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying that, first of all, I, I represent the view of the land managers, the people who are in charge of the land on the ground, which also includes its restoration and long-term conservation. 
but I wanted to sort of frame what I think the general conversation is and that what we are as a division focused on, and that is adaptive management, a term that Hugh has used, which is the intersection as I see it, and I think everyone probably has different terminology, but would be in agreement, the intersection between science and data, planning, design, restoration, and then conservation and monitoring, and in conservation I include stewardship and community engagement. And so I, we are each components in that circle or in that loop. So I'm going to speak from the land management perspective. I also want to echo one other thing that we've all sort of talked about, but I want to call out, and that is the importance of making sure that our ideas, our programs, our projects, and initiatives are in sync and complement existing or planned regional and citywide goals and initiatives. For a long time, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the history of the two institutions I'm talking about, which is the Natural Resources Group from the Parks Department and the Natural Areas Conservancy, which is a relatively new public-private partnership. We've been very focused on making sure that we're not working in isolation, that what we're doing links and is in sync with other initiatives. So I want to start by giving a little history, first to the Natural Resources Group, which is a division within the New York City Parks Department. And it was started in 1984, over 30 years ago. And it was started by a question, this question of the then commissioner, the, about a third of the Parks Department's portfolio are what are, what are natural areas. Uh, so that's about 10,000 acres. And he asked us then, I wasn't there then, um, what, what's there? What do you have? What is it made of? What is it composed of? And so people at NRG at that time did some initial assessments, we called them entitations, to get a fundamental sense of what was there, what was the ecological health, what was the degradation. And from that work and from that basic inventory, we got a sense, again, what was there and what we, should, what we thought we should do at the time. As it relates to wetlands, the first big thing that happened that started us focusing on the shoreline and the restoration of wetlands was the oil spill in the Arthur Kill in the early 90s. And that changed the paradigm, at least for us here, in that instead of there being some it's the best way to put it, um, generic restitution fee that probably went up to the state. What we, a bunch of groups got together in the same way that we're together now, trying to work in sync, came up with a restitution price that we thought was the value of the uh, destruction at the uh, Arthur Kill. And that money went into, in many different ways, it went into different accounts. But as it related to NRG, it went into the long-term restoration of the salt marshes and the Arthur Kill. That work directly then led into the Bond Act, which was 1996, which allowed us to get millions of dollars to restore sites across the city. And I'm speaking here just of salt marshes, wetlands by the shore, which in some, some of the work has actually been yielded now. It's taken that long for lots of the reasons, for lots of bureaucratic reasons, some that you're familiar with. Um, but it has restored hundreds of acres over time as a result of that money. We've also focused on freshwater wetlands, specifically our work on the Bronx River, in which we just unveiled the first fish passage in the southern part of the Bronx River that's allowing uh, alewife, which is a herring that hasn't been recorded in this area for centuries, to now make its way back up to its native spawning area. And I want to end with the history of the NRG by just saying, so this work, this evolution of this work, which started from this question about what do we have in these natural areas, and then led to very site-specific focus on wetlands in particular areas, has now evolved into this plan that we have called the Alley Creek Watershed Management Plan, which is emblematic, as I said, from uh, working from the site-specific to watershed planning. And the purpose of the plan is to protect and restore the resources of the watershed through the characterization of existing conditions, identifying the threats, articulating our goals, which is very important, suggesting comprehensive management strategies and specific actions. The plan gives 79 programmatic or watershed-wide recommendations over 60 sites in over 60 sites where stormwater management can be explored and 70 sites where we can do ecological restoration. What we're also trying to do here is link the work that we do along the shoreline and in the natural areas and the work that we are doing in the streetscape, the green infrastructure, which is capturing the water coming down the hill 
well, and the ecosystems and the wild habitats that are right by the shoreline, and then ultimately for the w filtering the water before it goes into the harbor. So the Natural Areas Conservancy was started about three years ago. It's a public-private partnership in the mode of the Central Park Conservancy. We're an independent 501c3, but we were started to be able to advance uh, and increase the capacity of NRG to do good conservation work. And so like any partnership, there's independent work that we do at the NAC, but it's all geared towards best management practices of local restoration and conservation. And specifically, our two, I'm gonna get into one of our other projects later, but our big signature project was the ecological assessment of our 10,000 acres of natural areas, which we have done over the last two years. It's one of the largest data sets on urban ecology in the nation, and it gives us reams of material and information on the ecological health of our upland forests, our maritime forests, our salt marshes. There's still more work to do on our freshwater wetlands, and that, that information, which I'll get into next, obviously needs to be synthesized and looked at to help inform our planning, design, and restoration processes. So um, two, I'm going to then talk, now talk about two specific projects, or two and a half specific projects, that will give you a sense of some of our assessment and data collection as it feeds this adaptive management loop, and then one of our sort of planning tools that we have developed. So we've gotten two EPA grants, and this is NRG in combination with NAC. Uh, this, the first EPA grant was the assessment of salt marsh conditions and vulnerability focusing on 25 of the largest salt marsh complexes across the city, not including Jamaica Bay in this case. The driver of this particular grant was the observation that over 100 acres of vegetated marsh have been lost in the last few decades in fringe tidal marshes. This work, the data collection, the looking at the spatial data has given us a sense of the quantity change in marsh area and the reconfiguration in the marsh area since this was last done in 1974 by DEC. The kind of things that we were looking at, evaluating vegetation type and cover, mapping impacts throughout the marsh complexes, conduct conducting long-term sediment accretion and marsh surface elevation monitoring, and identifying our management of concerns, our restoration opportunities, and the potential for mar uh, marsh migration. Our partners, and I mention our partners because we do not work in isolation anymore, even when it's the land management and it is the Parks Department's jurisdiction, we obviously our work is better done when we have our partners, particularly those who are situated in the community. Our partners here were the DEC Hudson River Estuary Program and NYSERDA, and we're also working with the Nature Conservancy to use this information to develop a Marsh Conditions and Vulnerability Index to, pr to prioritize our restoration and conservation work. The other EPA grant is to assess conditions of restored salt marshes and compare them to existing marshes. And you can see how that fits into this adaptive management feedback loop. If we're going to build sites, we need to compare them to what they were, how well, how, what, are they successful, are they failures, and we need to have some reference point, and that is the ex existing salt marshes. The Natural Areas Conservancy and its second big project is called the Restoration Opportunities Inventory. And it is a, it's a way to put together in lots of information in one place, and I want to emphasize that. Taking, we have NRG, we've existed for more than 30 years, has lots of disparate information, all housed in different places. We've had suites of managers over time, so some of this, may, uh, some of this data is in paper, some of it is obviously on computer, it is in one place. So this is compiling it in one place, unifying it in a way. What we've done to, uh, to put the restoration opportunities inventory together is informed by, as I mentioned, past and current NRG work. It's informed by HEP and the CRIP. Um, it's informed by the work that was done for the SIRR, Strategic Initiative for Rebuilding and Resiliency, for those of you who don't know that acronym, the New York City Wetlands Transfer Task Force, and the EPA grants that I just described. The kind of things that we looked at, and we looked at many, many different criteria, so I'm just calling a few out, is the size of a site, the cost per acre to restore it, links to local and regional plans and projects, ecological connectivity, 
land cover type, what kind of ecosystem or habitat is it, stewardship possibilities or the advancement of existing stewardship. And as a complement to the restoration opportunities inventory, we are developing conce conceptual designs for nearly 60 of the sites. I didn't mention that we, in the restoration opportunities inventory, we have over 120 specific sites that have, are compiled with all this, uh, all this different detail. And complementing that are 60, about 60 conceptual designs. Each design represents our vision and strategy for that particular site and how it links with other adjacent and regional sites. So in the introduction to this, you said we're, we should be pointing out either knowledge or regulatory gaps. So I thought I was obliged to answer that. Um, and so we have three questions, of course, that I think we're all asking ourselves. We know sea level rise is coming, and we know it's here. Uh, so what are the mechanisms of salt marsh loss at the water's edge? What is actually happening? How can we understand that to, of course, directly inform better design and conservation? What are the ecological trade-offs between mud flats and vegetated marsh? Can we justify retaining our marshes by building them back out? And will existing and restored marshes keep up with the sea level rise? It's a sort of rephrasing of the first one. So these are the things that we need to know, and it's part of that adaptive management loop that I was describing, and thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Bram. Um, huge amount of, of work and, and data that's being, being collected there. Um, okay, next I'm gonna turn it over to Liz. Great, thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? All right, awesome. Uh, I'm Liz Smith. I'm an environmental economist working with the Nature Conservancy. So I guess I represent both conservation and economics up here. Um, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about how we build nature into decision making in a more formalized way. Uh, specifically, thinking about resilient communities and how we think about the cost of adapting to climate change. There's two questions that seem to fall on my plate every few weeks and really framed how I was thinking about this talk today. So I thought I would tell them to you <coughs> since it's sort of how my mindset was. And they are, how do natural and hybrid infrastructure compare to gray only solutions? I'm often the economist in the room with many ecologists and so that is my question. And then what's the role of natural defenses in protecting coastal urban communities? Seems like we have lots of good answers to that. So in terms of opportunities, it, it's still hard for me to use that word in our, in our post-Sandy world, but, it, but it's true. A few years later, we have a different landscape. There's a broader acknowledgement of the impacts of climate change and this idea that we're all here today talking about how do we make our coastal communities more resilient is, is quite frankly kind of awesome. Um, what I also see in my world is a shift from thinking about traditional government-only funded gray infrastructure projects to tackle these issues. And so this idea of green infrastructure and how we integrate that for community protection. For me at the Conservancy, it's about getting into our natural assets and specifically those streams of benefits. And so what does that mean? It means trying to quantify them and trying to monetize them and trying to find a consistent way to evaluate the differences across projects. Bram, you just touched on this. Um, and then understand, so not just the differences in how the salt marsh is changing, but then the environmental, social, and economic trade-offs from a project. And so that's why this idea of monetizing some of the values around nature helps us have that internally consistent way to look at nature in this big equation. I thought I'd just um, give you two examples, one of a study that's uh, completed and one just underway to really talk about how this touches down. Uh, first a quick framing and uh, Pippa, Pippa already did some of this for me, but so when I say for me as an economist, when I say natural assets, I mean our salt marshes, our seagrass, our oyster reefs, our wetlands and our marshes. And when I say the streams of benefits or our ecosystem services, I'm really talking about the flood protection, the habitat, the nutrient regulation. Um, and you did a great job on the breakwater side of sort of laying out what those streams of benefits are through time. And that's what we want to understand more when we're building up these projects. So the first project, and I know a lot of people in the room are familiar with it because they were either part of 
initial stakeholder engagement or we're reviewing some of the work, but the Nature Conservancy in New York and CH2M, big engineering firm, um, began work on a conceptual study and post Sandy. And the idea was to look at a suite of coastal protection options for uh, urban communities where there was combinations of green and gray infrastructure to really understand those trade-offs and get that fuller suite of costs and benefits. So I'm sort of, you know, making reference to the dollars and the costs and benefits. I'm the economist. Um, but when it really comes down to it, every ecosystem is so different that we need our local understanding of how these systems operate to value that, to put into our equation. So folks like Bram and others that have these data inventories, that's key. And again, the plug for ongoing monitoring is such an important piece, not just to understand the ecological piece, but to be able to incorporate the economics of that into the equation. So, oh, my third piece, patience. Science takes time, so I, I, uh, I plead for patience. Um, so we understand, the better we can understand uh, the benefits of our natural systems, that allows us to build nature into our decision-making process and to understand how to make our communities more resilient. Uh, it seems like a simple equation to me and uh, just really nice to be here and, and hear so many people talking the same story. Great. Thank you, Liz. I think you made some really interesting linkages there. So thanks for sharing that. Um, great. And we're going to uh, now hear from Catherine. Great. Thanks, Jessica. I'm going to talk about Jamaica Bay, which Bram didn't talk about. So I think I'll address some of the uh, kind of good segue after uh, your presentation talking about salt marsh in the bay. Um, Jamaica Bay, with a total area of 39 square miles, has an area greater than Manhattan's 34 square miles. Because of this scale and with a strategic plan for the future success of its wetland marsh islands, that bay has the potential to be a significant asset in the future resiliency of this region. Saltwater wetland marsh is a magical thing with a single species, Spartina alterniflora, occupying the intertidal zone of the shorelines and islands of our estuaries and bays. To survive, this marsh, gra marsh grass species must be inundated twice a day with a diurnal tide. It has the ability to accrete upward and migrate upland as sea levels rise incrementally. It seeks the intertidal zone, it moves to that zone, and with the deposition of sediment and its own decaying biomass, it has the potential to move upward within its own footprint along this vertical datum. In other words, given the right circumstances, wetlands can keep up with sea level rise. Wetland ecosystem services include water filtration and storage, carbon sequestration, shoreline protection and stabilization, wave mitigation, wind fetch reduction, and the provision of intertidal habitat for a vast range of species. But since 1951, Jamaica Bay has lost almost 1,500 acres of vegetated marsh habitat, with accelerated marsh loss of 15 to 20 acres per year occurring since 1974. The area of the salt marsh islands within the embayment has decreased from 2,200 acres in 1924 to approximately 800 acres today. The reason for this loss of salt marsh is likely attributable to multiple factors acting in combination, including sea level rise, erosion, sediment deficit, nitrogen and phosphorus nutrification, and biotic influences related to water bird mussel and seaweed populations. Our recent work for Structures of Coastal Resilience at Jamaica Bay led to the development of paired strategic innovations for improving sediment distribution and capture with the goal of improved nourishment and accretion of the wetland marsh islands. The first strategy is the establishment of overwash plains and flow paths at the Rockaway Peninsula, improving the delivery of sediment from the ocean to the bay and increasing the bay's overall budget sediment. Sediment budget, excuse me. The second strategy is the construction of what we've dubbed atoll terraces at the perimeter of the marsh islands. These are raised marsh terraces constructed slightly above the intertidal zone, formed with strategically placed dredged material, also known as sand. Restoration, I'm trying to make everything really clear how <laughs> oh, it's working. Um, restoration and enhancement of wetland marsh islands at Jamaica Bay has been undertaken by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers since 2006 as part of their ecosystem restoration program in partnership with many agencies, including the National Park Service, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. 
Post Sandy, the Army Corps is studying how to merge these ecosystem restoration projects and their component nature-based features as part of their coastal storm risk, risk management strategies, uh, formerly known as flood protection. Our goal as part of this, the SCR Jamaica Bay Initiative is to build on these experimental marsh restoration successes while establishing novel strategies of restoration that would use a smaller volume of dredged material more efficiently across a greater extent of the Jamaica Bay Marsh platform. This would be achieved by harnessing the natural processes of tidal current and flow with what we call the island motor to capture suspended sediment, sedimentary material with the constructed atoll terraces acting as sediment traps. We hope to use advanced modeling tools studying sediment distribution and deposition, as well as our ongoing physical sediment models, um, to continue our research to determine and verify the most effective placement of the atoll terraces and overwash plains to achieve improved sediment capture, deposition, and accretion of these marshes. The strategic placement of the atoll terraces will harness the natural systems of tidal current and encourage deposition within the marsh island footprint. In addition, the terraces, which are formed specifically to reduce wave energy and turbidity, as well as encourage deposition, will provide an ideal slope for the establishment and upward migration of low marsh grasses, as well as conditions for achieving the water quality and light penetration that are required for the success successful establishment of submerged aquatic vegetation, which would then stabilize the benthic zone. Our goal with SCR is to support the work of the Army Corps, whose ecosystem restoration projects at Jamaica Bay Marsh Islands seek to counteract the continued loss of wetland acreage. Improving the upward accretion of the marsh islands at the bay will enable these islands to keep up with incremental sea level rise. In addition, the location of the marsh islands in the intertidal zone and the high marsh atoll terraces just above the high tide level also serve to reduce wind fetch and wave height, combating the erosive impact of waves on the shorelines of adjacent communities during frequent low, low return period storm events such as nor'easters. We hope with our research to complement the Army Corps' expanding interest in coastal storm risk management strategies that merge these nature-based features and green infrastructures with ecosystem restoration. And ultimately, we support the future success and indeed the continued existence of the salt marsh islands at Jamaica Bay through the strategic use of dredged material resources, the improvement of water quality at the bay, and a rust, robust palette of plant material. Thanks. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, so thank you, yeah, a round of applause for the panelists. Um, so there should be cards that are floating around the room. Oh, we got some. Great. Um, so I'm going to take a look at these. Um, but I just wanted to kick it off um, first with a question of my own. And then also, I'd like to see if any of the panelists have any questions for the other panelists, because I feel like you guys would have a really good conversation together as well. Um, but if you could name, um, if each of you could think about um, one the main obstacle you see, if you could name one, uh, to sort of advancing this work, and the one thing that would be most useful uh, to you in, in furthering uh, uh, the work that you've been discussing. Uh, anyone feel like? I'll, I'll start with the end, Great. don't mind. Yep. Um, as, an, as an overall, the answer is data. It's, it's good long-term data sets so that we can track the changes in ecological function through time. I might edit this after I look at Bram's monster data set. But, <laughs> but as a general rule, that's one of the toughest things. And as other people have identified, long-term monitoring is very hard to get funded. And it's critical. And it's critical from an ecological standpoint and from an economic standpoint. I'll reiterate that <laughs> um, more information, better information, and, and the data that's from there in place. And I think I'm really glad that you said long term because time, time matters in this stuff. And green infrastructure takes time. And, and how it works is how it plays out over time. And you don't really care how it works the day it gets built. You care how it works in five years and 10 years and 30 years. Um, and so having that, that long-term monitoring in place. So um, data, taking data now before it's there, um, and also a shared, the shared understanding um, of the questions we're asking that, go, that accompanies that monitoring plan, which is something else you brought up. Yeah. So from the, sorry. Uh, from the land manager perspective, there needs to be in place systems to use that data. 
the data can there's many much data that has been collected in my career as a land manager that just gets put on put on a shelf. And that doesn't mean the data was good or bad. I'm not judging it. But if there is no system for those who are in charge of managing the land and then also managing the land as it relates to specific communities and then regional communities, then the data doesn't serve the purpose that it was collected for. So we have to make sure that those are in place. And I think that's not only our obligation, that is also the researcher's obligations. And I think that's what everyone's working on is to make sure in this, uh, in this, in this relationship and in this link between all of us that the systems are in place for us to both understand the data, because I'm not a scientist, so I need help understanding it, and then in understanding it, how best and most effectively to use it. And I just want to add that data also has to include social data. Um, what, what, is, what is the community's values about a particular place? Um, what are they thinking about it? How will they participate in a long-term stewardship? And I want to add, and I did not add when I was speaking, that we collected this data on 10,000 acres of natural areas. We also did with our partners, the U.S. Forest Service, a social a site assessment, which was uh, inventory, interviewing people and neighborhoods accompanying or directly adjacent to these 10,000 acres of natural areas. So we got to get a sense of how to build their values into our restoration work. Yeah, I'll jump on the social end of things. I think, um, I, f I feel like data and it's, um, you know, the constant call for more data s is a little bit of a herring in some cases because we might just keep trying to figure everything out rather than action. So I think one thing that's very, very important is um, humanizing this whole idea about what is green infrastructure, what is a restored marsh island, and getting people engaged and excited and passionate about these places. And I think, you know, having, um, been working on Jamaica Bay, you may have noticed I'm quite very much engaged with that place and passionate about it. I know that uh, Mr. Mundy is in the room and I've been amazed by the power of his group to bring people to the marshes and actually have a kid understand what a Spartina plug is because they sit in the sun for hours. Well, they don't sit, but they work in the sun for hours planting those. And we've been able to be on a number of the marsh restoration um, events that um, eco-watchers and the American Little Society have done and the Army Corps has been very uh, much a big part of that in, in making those things available. So I think for me it's more um, kind of actionable things that can get done and that people can engage in. I think citizen science was used but also citizen action and um, really understanding that we are part of this environment. Yeah, going, going last is difficult. Uh, <laughs> funding was the first word that came to my mind, and, and that's really because it, 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 it feeds the data collection, the monitoring, of course. Uh, and having really a, a, a set funding stream, I think, is really important. I, I, have, I actually am more on the physical side. My background is, is more on the coastal engineering side. And so, for instance, one of the things that we don't understand that well is, is maybe how waves are attenuated through different wetlands or, or reefs. And that all ties to funding, which, of course, is, is then tied to a specific event. And that funding has to be there when the event comes. And we have to have a plan of action to do that. So ha having funding and having it in creative and separate ways is, is really important. And I also just reiterate, too, um, it's already been mentioned a few times, but the idea of the conceptual model or, or the, the influence diagram, if we have limited funding, we have to agree upon what it is that we're going to study and then also agree upon how we're going to revise that as time goes on because you don't need to collect everything maybe as you learn. And so those two things together I think are, are important. Great, thanks everyone. Um, is there any question that any panelist has for another panelist? If, if not, I can also go to the... Okay, all right. Um, so there's two questions about the Coastal Green Infrastructure Plan, uh, so maybe we'll try to get through those. Um, so there's a discussion about ecologically enhanced bulkheads. Have any been constructed and monitored? Please explain how these designs withstand toe scour and what design components are included to ensure longevity. Oof. I guess that's me probably, huh? Is Andrew in the room? <coughs> I was, I was half kidding, but uh, Andrew Rella actually helped write a lot of this, and he, he is here today, um, helped write that, and, and he and Chris and Marcel, who are, who are both here, would know more about what's on the ground. To be honest with you, I, I don't know the details of everything that's on the ground uh, with, with Toe Scour. But what I, would, what I can say is that I would definitely, Kristen's in the back, and Andrew was here. If whoever wrote that, come find me, and I'll help you find them, because I, I, can, I can go through that. That's about all I can provide, unless others have it. 
I guess I would just just add there's a few examples um, in New York City just um, you know I don't know where we are right now but um, along the Harlem River um, uh, Harlem River um, Park uh, there was a, a, a shoreline design there that sort of compressed a wetland and a bulkhead restoration into a small space so that's a great example that we have in the city that was done uh, maybe four or five years ago now. Um, and uh, there's also some experiments that Andrew's been working on, as Hugh mentioned, uh, that have to do with use of different types of concrete, different concrete mixes, and how that can um, accrete different types of biomass on it. And um, again, it's not my specific area, but he would be a great person to follow up with after this. Um, also, uh, in the Coastal Green Infrastructure Plan, uh, there's a recommendation for using common reed uh, phragmites for flow resistance. Doesn't this directly conflict with ecological restoration goals to eliminate habitat um, non oh, monocultures? Uh, what other recommendations are pending? Anyone? <laughs> I, mean, I can answer that one. The reason that that came up in the research plan was, well, two reasons. One is there's an understanding, and actually, most people, I, I, I would think, believe that Phragmites is certainly not providing the habitat, the Spartina one. There's a lot of evidence to support that. Some argue that there might be some ecological benefits to that that came through the, the research plan. Uh, the balance that we were finding and the reason that question was posed was because there were some residents and communities that firmly believe maintaining Phragmites next to their, their specific location was ideal from a, from a wave reduction and an erosion reduction standpoint. And so what we were posing in that was there are some, some questions within the research that we don't totally understand. We don't totally understand the vegetative drag uh, on, on the water column. We don't totally understand um, all, all of the ecosystem services and benefits that come from these species. And one, one kind of jumping off point was the suggestion for New York specifically, that might be an area, for instance, to focus energy is to looking, starting by looking at those species as we begin to try to answer these questions. So that, that's where that comes from. And whoever wrote that, we certainly recognize that challenge and that question, and that's actually why it was included. So I think this, I just want to highlight this particular issue because I think it, it brings up some things that you guys talked about, which is, you, Bram, you said values. Mm -hmm. Data isn't enough. Values matter, the value we place on the data. So do you value wave attenuation or habitat diversity more? And at some point before you decide to build your project or what's in it or what you decide to restore or mitigate or to keep that Phragmites or tear it out, you have to make a decision about 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 what you know what elements you value more. What's the weights of these values? So, we highlighted data, but the value behind that data. I think this this question really illustrates that. And so, um, that's a dialogue that everyone from you know particularly the decision makers, but uh, but from the community you know up to the highest level decision makers really need to be able to talk about. So, thanks for bringing that up for it too. <laughs> That was exactly what I was going to say. Um, so I'm not going to repeat that, but I do want to reiterate something that Elizabeth said. And I'm not making a value judgment here. I'm just sort of bringing this into the conversation. And she was talking about hybrid solutions. And uh, hybrid solutions also come out of your value set and also are framed by goals. Um, and you have to understand, as everyone has said, what you want to accomplish in that place. But there's n all this new literature that is coming out about hybrid solutions. Most of what I've read is not necessarily keeping fra Phragmites because of its attenuation capacities, but using a mixture of native green and gray. But there are areas where I can imagine people are thinking of these types of things. Uh, great. So next question, another question for you, Bram. Um, uh, so uh, Bram asked at the end of uh, at the end about whether restored marshes will be able to keep up with sea level rise. Uh, how are you changing processes of restoration uh, to make it more likely that they can? Well, that goes back to the EPA data study that I was describing earlier in collecting that data ourselves, also understanding the data that's collected by others, we can that will inform our designs as the best as it can be now to create 
um, marshes that can handle sea level rise. That's the best we can do at the moment. And then that comes, and then lastly, that there's where therein lies the monitoring. So if you're using the information, the leading edge information of the day, it's informing your design, you then need to monitor it. And is it succeeding or failing? If it's succeeding, why? It might be because you've made the right choices or it might be something else unexpected. And if it's failing, why? So you can amend and modify the designs that you have. So I know that sounds like not not really an answer, but that is the answer at the moment, at least from my perspective. Uh, great. So um, the next comment is uh, titled, One Thing We're Not Doing Well, which is it's good to, to not be positive about everything all the time and hear what we're not doing well. Um, how do we constitute uh, policies that mandate that materials going into waterfronts do not drive ecosystem destruction, such as deforestation? 20% uh, of global warming is from deforestation, yet we continue to use rain rainforest hardwoods on waterfronts. <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> We're all passing on that one. <laughs> Anyone? Wedge well, design guidelines, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, we, we're not, the city is not using hardwoods on waterfronts. Uh, I don't know the exact language of the codes. Uh, we're using different materials now. So I know that the city has moved away from those hardwoods altogether. At the same time, I know, not speaking directly for the city, that there's more and more sustainable harvesting in uh, air, tropical areas. I don't know much about it, so I'm not, again, making it value judgment, but I know that that's happening and people are thinking about that as a means to use these types of woods, but not uh, obviously create for their extinction. But as the city right now, unless it's a landmark territory, is not using hardwoods. He's saying that uh, that's not, what I just said is not true, that in fact, in the Staten Island Ferry Piers, they're using, where, I didn't hear where you said they're coming from, oh, from Guyana, woods from Guyana. Uh, I don't know the specifics, I just know the code, and I know some of the conversation as it is revolving around some of the areas that I'm familiar with. Um, great. So this is a question uh, geared towards the designers on the on the panel. Um, what is the role uh, um, that designers should play to create a great, resilient public realm where the city meets the water? Um, I think there's a couple roles of designers um, in all of this that I to that's worth touching on. I think there's been these design competitions and sort of bringing design thinking to the broader uh, way that we conceptualize these. Um, but, you know, at the at the ground level, there's sort of a sense of place aspect implied by that. And I think I think that's a another important role where um, designers and I'm a landscape architect, so I'll say landscape architects in particular, um, you know, we're used to working with with system with natural systems, plants that grow and change and people you know, we want people in the places that we design and build. And so as we try to build multi-purpose projects that are achieving multiple goals, designers can play a, a very big role in integrating, um, you know, what's, we have these engineering requirements, we have these ecological requirements, we have reality about people, how people want to use the space. And to make sure that we work collaboratively and iteratively to design, ultimately design a waterfront that accommodates all of those things. It's very easy to get focused on, um, you know, on one piece of something. I want to make the best salt marsh that I can, but if you leave people out of it, then there's no way to actually engage them in the monitoring or the maintenance, and then who sustains it over time? So I think that that designers playing that role um, is is a very important um, important part of of the process. Yeah, maybe I'll add a little bit. I think it's a tricky question, too, because I think there seems to be a kind of end game implied um, that somehow every waterfront should be accessible to people. And I'm not completely sure if that's the right idea, because that would say you may no longer have a working waterfront or an ecological place that people shouldn't walk on. So I think that this notion of the continuous accessible waterfront needs to be challenged. I think we've seen the continuous non-accessible waterfront, which is also not the ideal. But I like the idea of 
a working waterfront on the north shore of Staten Island where tugboats can both moor and ducks can walk up on the shore. And that maybe people that are not wearing hard hats or part of that particular industry are not welcome there or not allowed to be there because of safety reasons and because it's a working waterfront. So I think that there's an idea of a patch waterfront which might be more in keeping with some ecological and social realities that in fact, um, if people are present, all the non-human biota are pressured. And I think that that doesn't necessarily give us the most sustainable waterfront we could have. I, think I, just, that's a good, I just want to follow on that too to highlight, go back to the values question. I think this is a really important point. And as we build out these projects, having that discussion when you go into a restoration project or an open space project, I think too often people just assume that all of these pieces are at play, but very real in projects, there are always trade-offs. And there are places where a working waterfront may not be compatible with a publicly accessible waterfront, or a pristine natural area may not be compatible with that. But we really need to talk about that early on um, and compare the values. And if you convey those values, you as the, the city agency or the community, to the designers, what designers and design teams can help with is how to find creative solutions to achieve the set of values that you want and let you know when you need to make a trade-off or when they can be achieved together. Uh, great answer. So um, unfortunately, we're, we're actually out of time. So I have a few questions that unfortunately I didn't get to, but um, thank you all for, for um, submitting these. We'll stick around for a few minutes um, in case you want to come up and speak to anyone. Um, but thank you again to all the panelists and thank you all for coming.